Hello, everybody. Um, this is week 17 of the ENM 2020 course. Uh, looks like we have a pretty small instructor team today. It's just Marlon and me. Um, Mona sends her her regrets. She had a, a doctoral dissertation defense to attend, so I guess that's a pretty good excuse. Uh, let's see where we are in the course is um, this week we had an overview of algorithms and then a bit of a commentary on algorithm choice. The overview was from Janet Franklin and the commentary from me. Sorry about that. And uh, for next week we will have an introduction to Maxent from Corey Marrow and then we'll jump into other um, other algorithms and other platforms. So essentially today we start answering questions about um, I didn't share my screen did I? Nope. No that was pretty dumb wasn't it? There we go. Today we start answering questions about um, algorithms and choice of algorithms. So these are the questions you guys have been asking all along uh, and we've been careful to not answer. Uh, so, you know, Marlon, you say when you see something fun, uh, I'll start off with this one. Is there any chance that in the future we are going to have a new algorithm for ENM which will be better under all circumstances, or is it simply not possible? Oh, interesting question. Um, the no free lunch theorem, which I talked about in my talk, says no, which is to say each algorithm has strengths and weaknesses, and each algorithm has uh, situations where it's going to do better or worse. And the, the no free lunch uh, or no silver bullet idea is exactly that, that, that because the challenges are different from one um, species to another or one landscape or one environmental space to another, um, they're literally, the, the challenges are so distinct that there shouldn't be the silver bullet, essentially the, the algorithm that does everything ideally. Now, for a long time, like maybe the first 10 or 15 years of, of this modern era of distributional ecology, uh, people were producing new algorithms and um, kind of actively throwing new ideas out there. Let's try a genetic algorithm. Let's try maximum entropy. Let's try uh, ensembles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was that gave us the diversity of algorithms that we have now, but it also kind of led to this plethora of, situ of solutions that I think can be cr pretty confusing to somebody new in the field. And that, that um, fad has, has largely stopped now. Um, and so now what you're seeing in many cases, like the KUENM um, platform that Marlon will talk about later in the course, uh, now what you're seeing is more, how can we take some of these very good ideas of algorithms and make them better? And so, um, you know, Dan Warren brought in the idea of, of Akaiki, uh, statistics and, and model selection to the maximum entropy world. And then Marlin's KUENM brought in uh, more refined model selection criteria uh, to the same question. And so I think we're making each one of these better, but that probably doesn't remove the no free lunch idea that different classes of algorithms will probably do better in different classes of situations. Now, the one thing where I think we can do qualitatively better, actually, I'll throw out two. 
And this is not so much in the sense of a new algorithm as in the sense of a better framework for doing what we're doing. Um, is later in the course, you're gonna hear from uh, Kate Ingenloff talking about uh, time-specific modeling. And this is essentially saying, why in God's name are we, um, are we using average conditions at a site? So this isn't so much changing the algorithm, but changing the whole data flow uh, protocol. And essentially we're saying that a species exists at a place, at a point in time. And that point in time is associated with specific environmental conditions. You know, here in Kansas where I am, summer and winter are like the difference between the Arctic and the tropical rainforest. Or in Ecuador where, where Marlin's from, the difference might be uh, rainy season versus dry season. But conditions are not constant through the year or through time or across a century. So that's one thing that I think makes a, a qualitative difference. And then another, which we'll hear about also, uh, is coming from Laura Jimenez and, and Jorge Soberon. And this I think is really an interesting one because we talk about wanting to estimate the fundamental niche, and yet we estimate things that don't look much like fundamental niches. If you look at the re response surfaces permitted by a GAM or by Maxent or by GARP, they are not necessarily convex in environmental space, but there's very, very good reason to think that um, physiological responses are unimodal in environmental space. And that means that uh, multivariate niches should probably be convex. So I think we have the possibility of improving what we do qualitatively by means of um, better conceptual frameworks and better thinking that connects the conceptual framework with what we do when we press the button and calibrate our model. But I don't think that there is, you know, one model to one algorithm to rule them all, okay? Marlon, any questions you like? I can just keep going. Um, here's one. After this overview, I understand that the ugly algorithms are interesting to, to know because of their relevance. I'm thinking that the question is at the historical beginnings of niche modeling, but are not recommended to use. Well, if you noticed the no silver bullet paper that I uh, presented in that same talk, some of those ugly algorithms ended up being in some cases for some species, the best algorithm for that particular task. So I would not discard them. The Elith et al. paper was a, a significant step forward at its time, uh, but the, the model evaluations uh, were not done um, ideally given what we know and think these days, you know, 14 years later. Um, the no free lunch, no silver bullet thinking would move us significantly away from that idea of average performance being an indication of which model to use. Uh, if you instead look for which is best right now for this circumstance, for that species, for that particular environmental space, I don't think you're gonna use average performance as an indicator. Rather, what you're gonna do is you're going to um, present some test 
to the different modeling algorithms and see which one performs the best in that test for that species, for those environments, et cetera, et cetera, and use that algorithm or those algorithms and not the others, which is to say, which algorithms are ugly or good or bad depends on the species and the environmental characteristics. So here's one to, to think about. Marlon, you just speak up when you see a question you want to. Uh, uh, I, I, I have, I have a, like a comment on what you said and what okay. you said. Go for it. It's, uh, it depends also on your question. If you're interested in the ecological niche or if you're interested more in the distribution of a species in a certain area, it also, uh, like that's why you need to know what each algorithm is doing because they have different characteristics uh, and they characterize environments suitable or unsuitable differently. For example, random forests, they are very good uh, classifiers, but uh, when you see those predictions in the environmental con uh, space, you may have a scattered high levels of suitability and no suitability in between those sometimes. Uh, and that, that's not good for an ecological niche model, but for a classification of environments that the species is using, it is a good uh, model for that. And, and that comment would lead to a further comment, which is that um, you will hear about efforts to you know, model every species in a fauna or a flora, or um, collect and store ecological niche models for future use. And, and this idea pops up over and over and over again. I think it's a bad idea precisely for what Marlon just pointed out, which is that a niche model isn't a thing. A niche model is a whole class of things that can be tuned for you know, predicting distributions or, or uh, def defining the limiting ecological niches. They could be for prediction or they could be for explanation. They could, for whatever purposes, uh, I pointed this out years ago on a, in a, a little paper in biodiversity informatics, where I pointed out that these uses of the models are so different that they may lead us to very, very different choices about which kind of technique to apply to a particular situation. I'll, I'll put that paper up on the, the course site. Um, but my point is that I don't think it is ever or at least often a good idea to reuse and recycle niche models. Uh, I think most of the time, we can think that running a new niche model that is exactly sculpted to the purpose at hand, that may be much better than reusing something and avoid lots of noise and lots of you know, crap that otherwise sneaks into our, our uh, model outputs and results and such. So here's a, a question, just what is the, the advantage of the method of, of, of linear regression methods? And so, you know, that's, that's interesting. You know, general linear models have been used in niche modeling uh, for quite some time, and they're still used um, at least in combination with other, um, other algorithms or other, other uh, response types. For example, in some of the, the R packages we'll be hearing about, uh, you have a, a, a linear model um, dimension to the, the modeling. Um, so what are the advantages? One very clear one 
is that there exist exact um, Akaiki statistics for those models. Um, as you will find out in coming weeks, the uh, AIC framework for um, for Maxent, for example, is improvised. It's useful, but it's not exact and it's not complete. And you have those for for more traditional uh, methods like uh, like general linear models. Uh, but um, you're also constrained by the type of response that those models can fit. And so you have to be very cognizant of the fact that if you have a complicated response or perhaps a, a limited set of, um, of negative data that may create some really serious biases in the contrast between presences, and in this case, it would be pseudo absences, um, you may have some serious problems um, with, with the kind of response surface that linear methods get, are gonna give you. Any thoughts on that, Mar Marlon? Yeah, um, yeah, you're right. One of the things that I like from this kind of models is that, uh, well, people really need to understand them to, to tune them better. Like for example, adding quadratic responses or linear, linear and quadratic product responses and, and so on, like the ones that you can add. And it's interesting when you try to do so because you're gonna have to find information on what they imply uh, for the model. And that, that actually you're doing what uh, Maxim is trying to do when it's uh, calibrating a model and that lets you, leads you to learn from uh, your own exercise. And I like that as well. And they do produce good responses you have to be aware that you have to select the correct uh, family of models and all that. But all of that is interesting. It's a good exercise. I think if people can start working with that, it's, it's an advantage because it has uh, the I A AIC metrics and also because you learn from your exercises. Okay, I have a question here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's 2179. It says, yeah. Is it worse to have higher bias or higher variance when building models? Good question. It is a good question. <clears throat> well, imagine you are shooting to a target and I think that's the classic example of accuracy and precision. That's exactly what these two things uh, represent. If you have higher bias, you may be shooting uh, towards areas that are not close to the center of the target. So your response is gonna be different than the actual answer. And that represents uncertainty in your predictions, all those biases. And that makes your answer not exact because they are not representing uh, the phenomenon you want. And variance represents precision because you can shoot always to the same point and that's going to make you very precise. But you can shoot very spread around an area, but always close to the same answer. And that's going to make your 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 precision lower but and also that's going to in mod, in the model <clears throat> that's going to represent uh, a vari more variable model so those are kind of different things if you can get uh, high variance but close to the right answer it's good you can represent the variance but it's very complicated to see how uncertain or how uh, non-accurate your models are because those biases come from the data and those are the ones that lead you towards uh, fake responses or not, not the not the actual responses 
we have a lot of those biases there. They're actually very difficult to measure in in the in, is, in this modeling world. Uh, there are some efforts, but I think like that's what we can do. If they uh, imagine that your coordinates, for example, they are not they don't have enough accuracy in the number of decimals you're using. Uh, sometimes they are georeferenced description of localities. They are not in the place where they should be, especially in highly heterogeneous environments. They are be more, uh, it's gonna be more complicated to get the right environments that you actually sampled. And we have also biases in the environmental variables we have. So we, we, we have problems and all the data cleaning steps that I think uh, people already talk about in this course and all the curation of your data is gonna help you to have less bias and with, with that probably better accuracy, but uh, variance doesn't depend on that necessarily. It may depend on the environmental scenario where you're modeling in your area and it also depends uh, you can add variance to a model like doing replicate subsampling and stuff like that and that's not bad if whenever you show like if, if you show the variance of your responses of your predictions that's that's not bad having a ba uh, ba really biased uh, set of data that's more dangerous I guess I interpreted the question as more, would you prefer that your final models be biased or just uncertain? Uh, and I think, I think it comes down to the same answer, which is, you know, bias is a consistent deviation to a, an incorrect solution. Whereas variance or, you know, or uncertainty or lack of precision uh, is simply that you don't get always right on the right answer, but you're focused around the right answer. And I think very clearly, I'd much rather deal with higher variance than bias. Mm -hmm. In fact, in, in the KU group, uh, we've been dealing with these questions literally these days um, where we're trying to model a species that's distributed uh, across East Asia, there are lots of points, like more than a thousand, lots of points available. And when you start weeding them down, you know, you put in a distance filter and you come, you come way down. But if you look at what's left after a distance filter of you know, 30 kilometers or 50 kilometers, you see that there's a lot of bias towards coastal environments and insular environments and that's going to that is going to bias our niche estimate and so my solution to that which wasn't universally appreciated uh, my solution to that was uh, to downsample essentially throw away data from those coastal and insular and peninsular situations to the point that we have a more balanced data set. Well, it took us down to 18 usable points. And clearly building models with just 18 points for a species with a pretty broad distribution, that is very clearly going to introduce a lot of uncertainty, a lot of high, you know, a lot of variance but hopefully it will be more centered on the truth than had we allowed some countries to have 20 or 30 fold more points than other countries with different environmental situations. So yeah, go with, go with the higher variance and avoid the higher bias. I had one up here that I was wanting to get to. There we go. So here's an interesting question. Um, if I'm modeling with a set of algorithms, how can I determine whether the consensus 
of the results of those algorithms is a better approximation to the result of a particular algorithm. So as with the, the, everything else in my world, it's a matter of testing with data. So if you have the luxury of an independent data set, use it. You know, if you have, I don't know, 200 points and half of them are um, from museum specimens and half of them are from iNaturalist, don't necessarily use all of them to calibrate one master model. Better use, use one of them to calibrate a model and use the other to, uh, to test the model. And that will give you a rigorous test of whether um, the consensus is the best view or the individual algorithm outputs. Um, if you don't have independent data sets, then you're, you're limited to this idea of subsetting. We're going to talk about all of this later, uh, but you're limited to this idea of subsetting your data. And uh, that has its limitations. We'll talk about that. We talked about it a little bit already. Um, but essentially, uh, you should be very strategic in picking and identifying subsets for evaluation uh, so as to avoid getting essentially fooled by um, some of these, these biasing um, factors. And, and you know, essentially, the, the data speak for themselves. If the consensus is better or an individual algorithm is better at predicting and anticipating an independent or semi-independent data set, then there's your answer. Uh, I'll point you towards the work of Gengping Zhu. Uh, I'll put a paper up on the, on the course site where he's done quite a bit of, of comparing these two things, the, the uh, individual algorithm outputs with the consensus outputs. So check out the course site for that. Yeah. I'll also like just real quick recommend that pay attention to your question and what the algorithms do. Then you reduce the set of models that the set of algorithms that are useful to your question. That's the first step. And then you can also uh, like think about how how consensus are done. Probably not all model, not all algorithms are like easy to make a consensus for. Uh, and also think that given that not all algorithms using this use the same input data or use it the same way, uh, the metrics for evaluating them are different. So be aware of those things that are important before thinking that a consensus model of different algorithms is going to be better than one or two that you pick based on uh, how you're managing your in research or your question. Uh, Jorge Soberon is always pointing out that uh, these different algorithms actually estimate different entities, different objects, different kinds of probabilities. And so when we do a consensus of different things, like, you know, what is the probability that the environment is suitable if the species gets there? Or what is the probability that the species is there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if we're combining things that conceptually are different, we really are combining apples and oranges, and we're getting out something that's kind of a weird amalgam of things that are that are actually not combinable. So here's a question that just brings back some nostalgia. Uh, how effective is GARP species distribution modeling compared to other such models like MaxN? Well, you know, GARP was one of the very early machine learning approaches to these questions. Um, 
And in that sense, it was one of the first ones that uh, many people were using. I certainly used it a lot back in the past. Um, GARP, the, the desktop version, uh, no longer functions on almost all uh, modern computers because it hasn't been supported in a couple of decades. Um, but GARP is still available via the Open Modeler platform, which I think still functions on most platforms. Uh, so it's there, it's available. Uh, it has not been maintained, it has not been updated, but many of the things that, that GARP did were, were perfectly reasonable and perfectly useful. Um, and then I would just throw it back to the the users in our class, which is to say, um, think about silver bullets. Maxent is a very good, very usable, very effective algorithm and will be the best algorithm under some circumstances, but not all circumstances. And GARP will probably end up being the best algorithm available under some circumstances also. So, you know, again, I just don't believe that there is one best algorithm or that one algorithm is always better than another. Here's one to look at. Um, how can we identify the advantages and disadvantages of each algorithm in order to select the appropriate one? Well, as, as Marlon pointed out to you, some of the answer to this question is look at the characteristics of the algorithm. For example, is the output continuous or is the output binary or, or discrete? Or um, is the response surface complex or simple? And so there, there are some clear characteristics that we may want to prefer or to avoid depending on what our question is. And then, you know, the other point of view is no silver bullets. Pick out a bunch of algorithms and challenge them with some test and see which one performs best. Use that algorithm or that small set of algorithms that perform best. Just add that, well, look at your data. Some algorithms require to have absences. Do you have, do you really have absences? That that's an important question to ask. There are some, there are some tools, very useful tools that allow you to explore different algorithms. But uh, pick the ones that, pick the algorithms in that trying that you actually have data for. If you don't have absences, if all your your non-presence environment is only something that you want to see if it's similar or not similar to your occurrences because that's what that's what your data allows you to do then just use those ones uh, because assuming something random from the background is absence it's an important uh, assumption and it's a huge deal in your models it's certainly been done frequently there would be yeah. dozens or hundreds of papers in the literature that have used what's called pseudo absence data as a proxy for absence data. Probably um, formally, we should not do that, but it has been done. Well, Carmen asks, can algorithm selection be taxon dependent, like one better for insects and one better for birds? Or is it more dependent on the type of data? Presences, present pseudo-absence, presence-absence. Um, I think my answer, Carmen, would be yes. Which is to say, um, I think certainly uh, there are algorithms that are gonna be better for certain data types. 
but also there are probably algorithms that are better for highly mobile species like birds that probably tend to be more Hutchinsonian. That's a huge generalization. To me, just it comes back to independent testing and um, essentially allow the data and the results to speak for themselves. <clears throat> this is an interesting week because we are getting very similar questions. Yeah. I'm trying to pick different ones. It's being complicated. Yeah, there's the Okay, so if we want to develop robust predictive models, then why would we care if an algorithm has high bias? And why would we want to reduce that bias when robust by definition means having good results even if the assumptions are violated? Mm -hmm. Well, bias, if we're talking about bias in the outputs, then they're not gonna be robust or predictive. Right? A biased result is one that deviates from the right answer. Now, if we're talking about violating assumptions, like what Marlon said about absence data versus pseudo absence data, or some assumption of normality, or some, some assumption of orthogonality of environmental dimensions, well, Remember why those, uh, those strictures or those cautions are out there in the literature. They're there because it is known that those algorithms don't function properly when those assumptions, those particular assumptions are violated. So yeah, you can use them and you, know, you could come back to what I've said about 20 times this this session already, which is let the data and independent evaluation uh, speak for themselves. But you're kind of setting yourselves up, yourselves up for failure if you deliberately, uh, blatantly accept using an algorithm when its its assumptions are violated. Yeah, there is no robust model if your data is garbage, you're gonna get a garbage. <laughs> it's the principle of any anything like uh in the modeling world of everything I mean. Here's one related to that. If an algorithm has strong assumptions, will it have strong biases as well? Not necessarily. Think about the assumptions as a set of uh, entry requirements. If your data are, let's say, normally distributed and your environmental data are orthogonal, then you're able to use this algorithm. And then this algorithm is appropriate. But if those assumptions are, are violated, then the usual phrase is caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Okay, it's your problem if you opt to use an algorithm under circumstances where you've been told this algorithm doesn't work as well. There is one in 2161. When working with many species, um, can I use different algorithms for each species or is it better to use the best average, the best model on average, considering all the species that I'm working with? Good question. Again, I mean, it depends on your question. 
on your question in terms of what you what do you want to model probably it's better to predefine your algorithm or algorithms that you want to try uh, but averaging model outputs from different algorithms again it's risky not all algorithms produce the same kind of uh, prediction so i don't know probably a binarization of both products of the different uh, or the different uh, model uh, modeling algorithms and then sum them and see where do you get the most uh, coincidence or something like that, that can give you a better like consensus but averaging max and ellipsoids ellipsoids outputs for example I mean, even if maxing is parameterized so you can have com convex shapes, that's not always the answer you, you get. So it's risky. Yeah. Uh, and it, <laughs> working with many species, that's, that's a lot more complicated. And probably keeping it simple will work better. Uh, and probably some of the species <clears throat> maybe are not easy to model and some of the species you're not going to be able to model it because of the band configurations and all that like they are well Asian species and none of the algorithms is going to give you a good answer a good prediction I think you've got to you know as Marlon said you've got to think about uh, what are your goals um, certainly averaging different response types. So, you know, again, like, like Marlon said, a, an ellipsoid and a, and a maxent or something like that, it's a pretty bad idea. But I think binarizing or you know, thresholding your models um, by some uniform criterion may be a much better approach. And then those can be combined afterwards, which is to say once they're thresholded and once they're binary, uh, then it's probably much more robust to combine them. Um, I think you could build arguments either way, um, depending on the, the needs of your study. Uh, if, you, if you were looking for something that's, I don't know, based on probabilities or something, uh, like some of the, the place prioritization applications do, then probably using one output of one algorithm is the best approach. But if you're looking for kind of a best distributional estimate for each species, uh, then using some sort of thresholded uh, no silver bullet approach is probably better. That's a tough question. Yeah, it is. So is Maxent the only algorithm that can be used with presence only data? Definitely not. Um, one of the very earliest niche modeling approaches was BioClim. And that is certainly presence only. And then there's a whole class of, of algorithms based on distances. So essentially in environmental space, how close, similar, or far uh, different is every pixel in the map from a site of known presence? And that also is certainly uh, presence only data. So you have some options. Um, Maxen is probably the most sophisticated of them, certainly the most popular of them, uh, but you have a bunch of options. Here's an interesting question. Uh, I think the answer is, is no, but um, basically the question is when using AUC to evaluate models, Maxent looks like the best, but Kappa or TSS, it's not as dominant. Um, so we've, we've got a lot to talk about about model evaluation, but I think this is kind of a, a, a false correlation that you're picking up on. Um, the basic answer is that 
AUC, Kappa, and TSS all uh, weight presences and absences equally in, in the statistic. And uh, we know that almost always we don't have absence data, or we don't have absence data that are trustable and usable and robust. And so right away we have this big problem with how do we fill in the absence side of the AUC or Kappa or TSS? And um, that's not an easy question. Um, it basically comes down to, at least in my view, we shouldn't be using those techniques, except in situations where we do have absence data. And that's why in those two papers that I talked about, um, the Salp et al. paper and the Chow et al. paper, those were based on virtual species. And so we knew presence of suitable conditions versus absence of suitable conditions. In most empirical studies that you're going to do, you don't have the absence data. And even if you say, well, I know that these 50 sites, the species wasn't there. Well, okay, but look at the BAM diagram. A species can be not there because of A, which is, yes, the Grinnellian niche or the uh, you know, what a niche model should be telling you, but also it could not be there because of M, dispersal limitation, or because of B, biotic interactions. So you have to know quite a bit about your absence data before you could use it. And so we'll talk about alternatives like, uh, like partial rock, for example. Um, but it really comes down to the fact that we don't have a good way of dealing with our absence of absence information. And this, it's a very hard question as well. There's a lot of people that do have absence data. And even though you have to think about it, because imagine how complex landscape can be. And I mean, if you have gone to the field, you may have seen environments that are very similar or probably even the same in the same square kilometer. But because of uh, soil, soil difference or, or like the same vegetation cover difference, you have absence and presence in the same pixel. So if you, if you train your model, which only uses a uh, pixel size that does not have that precision and does not consider soils or land cover, because that's generally not a good idea in, 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 some up, in most of applications uh, at, at broad level, then you're going to be saying to the model, okay, this pixel is suitable, but it's also non-suitable based on your presence and absence data. And of course, there is ways in which uh, different algorithms manage that kind of information. But think about it first and think about the quality of your data and the goal again. The precision, not the precision, but the resolution of your environmental variables, the scenario in which you're working. It's modeling niches is not just grabbing bioclimatic variables and your data from GBIF and put it into an algorithm. Uh, it requires certain uh, reasoning and thinking about what you want and what you have. Yeah, I mean, you can use soil data in there, but it's gonna be at a different spatial resolution than climate data, for example. Yeah, sure. It's hard. One last question, very quick. For modeling marine species, is there some kind of specification as to the algorithms to be used? No. Marine species can have broad niches or narrow niches. They can be in very heterogeneous situations or very homogeneous situations. 
They can be in well-represented or poorly represented sectors of environmental space. That's, good. That's what's going to define what algorithm is best for a species. I'm afraid I've got to um, close off this session because I have to teach at 10, 10 o'clock. So Marlon, thanks very much for joining me. It would have been very lonely if you hadn't. Um, and everybody have a good week and, and check out the, the videos to be put up on Monday. Thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.